Hi, thank you very much Bhargavi for inviting me to come and speak to you all here at the Dhi Art Gallery space. Uh, and I'm sorry I'm not going to be able to do this live uh, as I had hoped. But I have been given the task of talking about how to go beyond the classroom. As a professor whose life is limited to the classroom, that's one, uh, that's a slightly challenging thing because I'm going to have all my students now looking at this and wondering if this is a kind of a prescription for how they should break the rules and um, please do, uh, please do break the rules because I think the classroom really isn't the space anymore that can really expose you to everything that the world of curating really imagines or expects us to be able to deliver when we go into the museum world or we go into the gallery world. The classroom has become stultified. It's got divided into a category of uh, modern art, which is exciting, it's new, it's relevant. And on the other hand, we have the people who study art history in the pre-modern world and it's all about religion and it's about Indian spirituality and it's about uh, the good people wanting to run a good society and it's just like, it's as if it was not relevant any longer. And there can be nothing that is actually further from the truth because we know from the greatest marketing gurus and from the media and from the election results that we are looking all around us everywhere in the world that religion and tradition are being invented and being capitalized on because they are what is making the market and the electorate tick. And that tradition is being invented and interpreted by some people and the others are just too cool for school and just don't think that this is relevant any longer and they abjured their responsibility from engaging with classical literature, with mythology, with history because it's suddenly passé and it's like boring and I, I don't think it is. I, I don't think you can afford to let it be boring and I think it is contingent upon us as curators and as uh, pedagogues to be able to make it relevant for the younger generation and continue to demonstrate why it, these things are called classical because they have the capacity to be reinvented and be relevant in every age. And, um, and I think there are ways in which we can do that and I've uh, I've been told that I've been able to achieve that in my exhibitions and thank you very much. It's, it's a great compliment to be told that. Um, and I'm now being asked to talk to you about how. Um, well, I think if truth be told, I have never shied away from the depth of research. It's been daunting. It's exacting to have to spend hours and hours in a library and uh, to have to read. I'm a slow reader. I myself am not a, a speed reading person. Um, I've always been a slow reader. And I think the discipline of having to read widely, stay relevant to a wide variety of issues and think about things by while writing them down, um, while slowly writing out one's ideas. This has been a great learning curve for me as a curator. Not the aspects of the formalistic aspects of design and line and form. I think those are things I developed in, in art practice. But I think the, the discipline that was required in communicating those ideas of line and form, of design and display, uh, of framing and um, um, staging had to be combined with an academic rigor, um, which has been very necessary to be able to work as a curator. And I think um, 
one of the ways and issues that I really want to stress on um, today in my talk is that history and the art and art history can be relevant, but it depends on what you want to include in it. Um, what is your idea and definition of the past? How, do you, how are you choosing to define it? Are you wanting to study it from a political lens or from an administrative lens or an economic lens alone? Or are you willing to consider aspects of cultural history that are relevant to you and, and look at how those things have panned out in the past? And I've tried to do that in my exhibition. So let me first give you some examples of those. Let's first take on the question of what we want to include in our history. Selecting an object from Nagaland was a deliberate curatorial decision on my part to be able to give the Northeast pride of place at the entrance to a grand exhibition on India. It was an exhibition to be opened by the President of India and the King of the Belgians at the headquarters of the European Union, after all. It all depends, as I said, on what history we want to tell and how we want to tell it. In this case, I chose to tell a history of how different Indian communities have commemorated death. This was not an act of swallowing up each and every community within a narrative of India, but each gallery explored the differences in how we have commemorated death in Indian history in different regions of India, and it became an opportunity to recognize and live with difference. My desire to be able to include the ethnographic within mainstream history continued in my next big exhibition as well, which was called India and the World and held at the CSMVS Museum in Mumbai. The exhibition was bookended by two works from the Crafts Museum. Starting the show was an Indian Hanuman from the 1970s with the famous statue of a Roman discobulus from the British Museum. Both are symbols of strength and athleticism and it was deliberately writing the ethnographic or the folk and tribal into the canon of art history. Exhibitions also provide the curator the responsibility to fulfill the act of bringing to light new objects and new research or new interpretations to public attention. I secured loans from more than 50 museums for the Body and Indian Art Exhibition, and I know what I gathered there will provide material for a whole generation of art historians to utilize in their studies. It was in one of those field trips that my attention was drawn to this remarkable bull from the Calcolithic period. Attention was drawn to the remarkable copper hoard objects approximately made between 1500 to 300 BC, which occupy a time period between the Indus Valley and the Mauryan, an age that remains a perplexing hiatus for art historians. Furthermore, not only was this remarkable object right in the middle of that period, it also comes from a region that we had not appreciated was a part of the wider Indian copper or bronze ages. Similarly, this object, where you see a Varaha, which has an inscription along his torso, these are new discoveries. They are challenging, they pose new questions, which destabilize our received histories. They affect chronology and even what we know of religion and language. It posed questions about when does Hindu iconography begin? Does the Harappan age have a bearing on later Indian art? Were the Calcolithic cultures Hindu and Brahmanical? Or did they have at least incipient Brahmanical culture that transformed into what we can recognize as the pantheons of Indian gods? I think these exhibitions have provided me an opportunity to revisit those postulates that we have received on Indian art. When we talk about using the exhibition to expand the canon, let me show you this. Examples of excellence in post-Gupta art, rather than just extolling Gupta art as the golden age, has been another concern of mine. And there was one grand object after another that one could place in the exhibition that came from that 6th to 7th century period, which is normally dismissed as a confusing post-Gupta period, a period that we do not normally have time to talk about in the classroom adequately. These objects here are all related to Shaivism, and they come from regions as far apart as Kabul and Peshawar and Karnataka. They are all symptomatic of the extraordinary philosophical developments that were taking place in the cult of Bhairav and the worship of the Shivling as seen in the Silver Mask, or with the grand terracotta dancing Ganesh, 
or on the other hand with that exquisite granite shiv shown with his energy rising through his yogic body's elongated torso this fact finding mission forced me to expand what we normally include in these exhibitions exhibitions can be used to bring to focus not merely marginalized epochs and unknown masterpieces of indian art but equally to question some of the fundamental premises of religion as well as of indian art history as well as the political environment that allowed these things to be showcased these remarkably refined and smooth sculptures certainly surprise many visitors to the show but i am not going to dwell on them right now and i hope some of you who are interested may find the two catalogs that were published alongside the shows useful to read up more about them and yes i think the writing of an exhibition catalog that is based on research has to be understood as a fundamental curatorial function it can take a good year to write a catalog and then it has to be designed and published as well the time for research and writing has to be factored into the costs of every curator's work these catalogs as i said contain so much that is new and previously unpublished that they provide both the material and ideas that many of my own students have been able to use to develop research proposals for their phd's our fact finding missions and field work exposed regions of india that have been neglected in the canon or standard textbooks of indian art it revealed their iconographic and cultural developments are not just related to the whole of east south asian art but these were places of innovation in religious doctrine and iconography and that's why places like chhattisgarh and multan sindh haryana kabul i mean one wonders why they are not in our classrooms does this comparison with other art traditions open up entirely new ways of studying indian materiality their quarrying their location their production processes on the other hand the curatorial exercise was not just about being inclusive and expanding the canon it was also about including themes that were relevant apart from including objects that come from diverse parts of india and so on and communities i think one's also got to pick up themes which are relevant politically socially culturally to us today and see what the history of those ideas is that i mean i recently finished uh, writing a uh, an article for an essay in, in the mark magazine on art and conflict in which i was talking about can museums and can art history start telling us what kinds of conflict there have been in indian society and how do artworks register that history of conflict one of these themes that i was interested in exploring was that of religious conflict islamic iconoclasm has usually been thought of as the only reason for the destruction of indian images however that's not the case this double sided image shows a beautiful ardhanarishwar in front but at the back it shows a corroded image of the buddhist goddess tara revealing that a buddhist shrine was probably appropriated by a shaivite sect of hindus we have many more avenues available to us today to tell stories and reveal our research the needs for art history have changed in a digital age and these are pushes that we are facing for the documentation of art often times that challenge the narratives that we have put out histories of conflict that have existed for millennia will be obvious to the public and archives and museums will therefore have to be protected they'll have to remain protected in order to be able to be autonomous and to be able to tell those stories responsibly in an age when disinformation and fake news has started informing us about our identity and tradition it becomes all the more contingent on the museum and its curators to redouble their efforts at making their research public and yes i do believe that the function of the curator is not just to show beautiful art but also to recognize that artwork has always responded to the political and cultural requirements of its times and in this regard it's important not just to see why a beautiful artwork was made but also why it was treated in the way that it was for instance violence in india as we all know was not just fueled by communal political agendas violence has been caste based and gender based too both these kinds of histories can be told through artifacts 
I explored some of the challenges that curators and museums face in a recent article published by Mark. One of the things that I republished in this article was the case of gender-based violence. Now, Unau has been in the news a lot because of the horrendous rape case that took place recently. This is an ancient case where violence against a female sculpture was perpetrated, again at Unau. Whereas ancient sources regard the Jain Tirthankara Mallinath as female by the 11th century, her gender had been changed to male. This happened with growing discomfiture in the Jain community on the subject of female nudity. And nudity was an essential requirement for a Tirthankar. So people began to believe that a woman was incapable of achieving moksha, and the only way she could aspire it was to be reborn as a man. The question that confronts us is, what forces at Unau perpetrated such violence on this statue of a female who dared to sit mindfully nude, brave and beautiful, with an exquisite plait falling down her upright back, with a single jasmine in her palm? There are grounds to believe that the image was removed from worship as much by patriarchal forces at Unau as by iconoclasts, who demanded its destruction. The third issue that I really want to talk about today as a curator is to come down to the subject of exhibition design. I think the exhibition design has become a very misunderstood subject. It's become like window dressing and that's not what exhibition design is really about. It's not about making it look pretty Curating is not about knowing the heights of objects and the framing devices of objects. You don't need a curator simply to do that. And you don't need an exhibition designer simply to do that either. You need to train exhibition designers in principles of architecture, but also they have to be receptive to and capable of working with the narratives of history that are relevant to us. And think about how the scenography is actually going to communicate those political and social and cultural ideas without it necessarily becoming an artwork. Like, for instance, sometimes I've had to take recourse to design strategies in the ambience to be able to have a visceral effect on the audience in order to be able to communicate something when an artwork itself could not communicate that. So let me give you a, a few examples of how one has been able to use the idea of use scenography and work with exhibition designers to be able to uh, complement one's curatorial narrative. Exhibitions need not communicate their message only through the artifacts that they are using, but the curator has to be sensitive to and guide exhibition designers to be able to create a mise-en-scene or create a scenography that can help with that communication. In the India and the World exhibition, we were able to work with uh, Brinda Somaya and Nandini Sampath, who created a very immersive gallery space for one of the galleries called Indian Ocean Traders, where you can see that on the floor, there is a cutout, a, a diagram of a ship. The idea was that we were entering a shipwreck. We were underwater. And these ships were carrying these Indian Ocean Traders from place to place, and it is their artifacts that they transported from one location to another that the gallery was surrounded by. So a gallery can become a very immersive experience that carries the theme, the story, forward. The Body in Indian Art in Brussels was an exhibition in which the designer Sabine Thunissen asked an artist, a nice taste, to paint the entire backdrop of one of the galleries on the supernatural body as a paradisiac garden for which we were able to use Kangra paintings with their impossibly florid landscapes as the backdrop. The scenography thus provided an opportunity to move away from prefabricated display techniques which can be boring, but also bring in the work of contemporary artists to be able to create the immersive experience, the subliminal experience that we wanted to communicate. One of the nicest examples of that, um, of how scenography can try alter the mood and carry the message, was seen in the gallery called The Body Beyond the Limit of Form. 
This was a gallery about an iconism, about the traces of the human body, not the actual anthropomorphic body itself. She very intelligently, um, she being Sabine, very intelligently used a screen as a white wall and the queues of people who were lining up to buy tickets, their shadows were being projected on that screen. They were absent, yet they were present. Their shadows were a part of the exhibition. The people became part of the exhibit. Similarly, inside the gallery, the magnified Sanji cut out of a tree created a screen that instilled a subtle feeling of emptiness, and you can see the leaves of the tree in this slide. Abstract things were put in this gallery. The white grave, the black buddhapada, the square, the circle, the black and white. These were all ideas that were being used to not just use objects, but to curate them and use the scenography to communicate their message. For my last slide, I'm going to use um, an image that it's not the best of images, but it does communicate something of what I uh, thought was a marvelous idea that Sabine was able to execute in this gallery. The gallery was called Rapture, the Body of Art, and it was about how we ourselves can become transformed or transported by art into another realm. The trick that was played was that the whole gallery was carpeted in red, and there was a red light everywhere where people would be walking. But the artworks themselves were carefully spotlit in clean white light. What happened as a result was that the people were transformed red, enraptured, but art was real. And so that was the difference that we had turned into art and we had been transported by art. Now this visceral experience is something that scenography could help us create. I hope this talk has been interesting and I've been able to communicate very briefly some of the things that we do to be able to see that the past is as relevant as the contemporary it can be as exciting in its presentation without it turning gimmicky but it can be subtle and yet communicate a profound point um, and i hope i've been able to communicate that i don't think I or any curator can really honestly do this, any exhibition designer can do this without the research that has to be at the core of doing art history and curating, actually doing the field work, reading about the iconography, doing the formalistic analysis. I think all that needs to go into it and in the first instance to then be able to come up with the best strategy to be able to communicate that outside the classroom and I hope that will get you all out of the classroom and to be able to experience these things in a, in a multi-sensory way that combines architecture, design, line form, sketching, uh, art practice along with history. Thank you all very much for having me.